really a lucky chairperson the, because uh, the older parents are very punctual. Uh, yes. Then uh, let's get started. I would like to uh, welcome all of you and thank everyone for coming to this session. Uh, topic of our session is smart cities, uh, driving Asian cities sustainable growth. The, this convention center is the right place to talk about smart cities as we are in the center of the future smart city in Binzon province. So um, I am Takashi Kawabata, uh, Chief, uh, Chief Asia Economist of the user base. That we have eight panelists from various sectors who are specialists on uh, smart cities or things related with smart cities. So I, I will introduce uh, following topics that before uh, start starting discussion. So please give me a few minutes for agenda setting. Uh, smart city is pretty much important topic when we talk about development of uh, Asia. In these few decades, uh, Asia experienced rapid and mass uh, massive uh, urbanization. Uh, this phenomena uh, reflect dynamics of economic growth in Asia and uh, various business sector benefited a lot uh, from urbanization. However, we face enormous challenges from urbanization. Um, so that all the, uh, all the uh, Asian uh, cities are highly congested, um, such as overcapacity of the logistics, shortage of school hospitals, a uh, huge amount of waste, and many others. The, so the smart city concept can be an uh, effective solution to utilize uh, IoT or other innovation. Then uh, I have been doing a research on Asian economy and politics since my university days. Uh, yeah, I already spent uh, more than 25 years uh, to the research on Asian countries. And I'm currently writing a news article for Newspeaks. Uh, that is a Japanese media under the user base group, uh, which is uh, growing economic uh, business media in Japan. And we have more than 3 million readers. Also, the, we, uh, uh, also, I do the research for the, uh, our business intelligence platform, SPIDA, under the user base group. So from our company ex experience, a uh, number of inquiries on smart city or smart city related matters is increasing. So the smart city is worth to discuss at uh, right this moment. So I would like to put four subtopics for this session. So, and then uh, all the panelists share your views or experience, your concept in three or four minutes or maximum five minutes. Uh, we have only 90 minutes, although we have eight panelists. <laughs> then uh, then uh, we have discussion among the, uh, all the panelists. If we, uh, if we have the re uh, remaining time before closing the session, I will open the Q&A to the floor. So the, the f so the, I, I would like to divide for the subsectors. The, the first three, the Professor Nitin uh, Tripathi, uh, he is a professor from Asian Institute of Technology from Thailand, yes. and Dr. Lon, uh, director of the Smart City uh, Development from Binzon Province. Uh, these two gentlemen will uh, talk about uh, trend of the smart cities in Asia, and secondly, uh, we discuss on the characteristics or, or concrete example of smart city project in Asia. The, we have three speakers for these subtopics. Um, Mr. Anil um, Bash, uh, Baskaran, uh, Managing Director of uh, Idea, Cent Idea, uh, Idea Center Architects from India. Then uh, Mr. Chawarit, uh, President, uh, Team Consulting Engineering and Management uh, from Thailand and uh, Mr. Takeshi Izuka, uh, president of Kirom Institute of Technology uh, from Cambodia. Also, he is a Japanese. And uh, we, uh, the, these three gentlemen uh, will share the experience in the Smart City project. And thirdly, we um, focus on the design and housing. Uh, uh, Mr. Tim Kobe, uh, founder and chief executive officer, uh, eight, uh, eight Inc. Uh, from Singapore. And uh, Ms. Uh, Liu In, 
uh, chief executive officer, uh, Le Mans Create uh, from China, but originally from Fri Finland, right? <laughs> and uh, we'll discuss how important designing uh, or ho housing concept are uh, important in a small city. And the, the first three, this is the last subtopic, the healthcare. Uh, Simon uh, Lovegrove, uh, director of uh, M Health Limited from United Kingdom, uh, will speak about uh, health tech in the smart city. Okay, uh, let's uh, begin with uh, talks by pr uh, Professor uh, Tripathi. Professor uh, please uh, share your, uh, your ideas on the smart city. Good afternoon, Dr. Taka, Mr. Takahashi and uh, all the panel members and all the participants in this session. I would like to uh, tell about the smart cities in India, the experience till now, and also kind of sustainability of the smart city. So I will start with the smart city in India. Uh, when our new prime minister took over in 19, 2014, then in 2015 he announced 100 smart cities in India. And uh, after a number of cities submitted their proposal, 100 cities were identified, but 20 cities were given green signal and funds to immediately go ahead. And uh, progress is very good. And out of the 20 cities, almost uh, 18 are almost ready. And uh, the next batch of 20 cities have been granted permission now. So, and it has been done to drive economic growth and improve the quality of life of the people. The total cost of the project is 30 billion US dollar and there are total 953 projects granted and uh, US dollar 4,600 million has been uh, released. I think uh, the cities which have not completed they will complete by 2019. So at least by 2019, uh, within say three years, 20 smart cities will be ready in India. That's a big achievement for India. And uh, I want to tell about one big project that has come up. A new province was created in November 2000. It is called Chhattisgarh. And uh, this was a totally backward area. And people thought that will be a backward province but by 2016, this province did very well and a new capital for this province, Naya Raipur or New Raipur was designated. And this is a 237 square kilometer area city, totally brand new city, a smart city and it is functional now. And it, ha uh, it is key projects where smart mobility, transport infrastructure, a skill development, a smart roads, smart communities, etc. And uh, some of the key points are that in this city, uh, this is a first of the greenfield smart city in India, and 27% uh, of the area is green. And a uh, cycle lane is there throughout the roads, all along the roads, so that people can uh, use cycle for mobility. Every building has rainwater harvesting that is compulsory. National Rural Development Agency has identified and created 55 reservoirs to maintain the water availability and save the water logging problems in the city. And there are three natural lakes which are preserved by NRDA. Public buildings have green building concept and natural sunlight is there in the daytime and they boost about it that sun rays illuminate their building. Asia's largest man-made jungle safari is coming up and it will be ready by 2019. Raipur is emerging as a major educational and health hub of central India. One new IIT, IIT is a brand name for education in India. Indian Institute of Technology has been created in Naya Raipur. Triple IT, Indian Institute of Information Technology is created. Indian Institute of Management is created. Ayush University, that is the first of traditional medicine of India. Uh, one university is created there. All India Institute of Medical Science is created there. National Law College, there are six law college created uh, in the last 10 years. So the sixth one is in Naya Raipur, National Law College. And Naya Raipur Stadium 
is uh, known to be at par with the Melbourne Cricket Stadium in Australia. When the cricket match was done, the Australian team told that it is just like Melbourne. So I think very good facilities are created in that smart city. And I think people's uh, perception of a smart city is being achieved. And uh, people are able to use mobile phone for paying their bills, like all municipality bills. They don't go to the offices to pay. Then birth certificate, tax payment, everything is by mobile now. And there are some three, 35 control stations for surveillance. There are cameras all around for security and safety. So 35 stations are collecting all the data and security is enabled. Then there are uh, there is there is a very good mechanism to see that LAN cables and all the IT infrastructure is immediately repaired if there is a problem. So there is a good like response system created. So these are the things that has come in a new city, and I think uh, this is a city to watch. And uh, but how will it sustain? That is a big question. Uh, we may create infrastructure, but it has to sustain when people's uh, participation is there, people like to live there. And for that purpose, I, I have done some study, and uh, I am a professor of geoinformatics, that is geographical information system. This can have maps, this can have tables, all the data. You can say big data also. And then it can mash up to come out with the information, and also plan and guidelines. So we can develop, in fact, we have developed uh, livability city index for one city, Konkane in Thailand, and we have applied the same model in another city, Sufanburi. So I propose that to maintain the uh, sustainability of the smart cities, because a lot of money will go into that, and we are trying to see that all the people should be satisfied, and the city can go on permanently. So I propose a uh, index or like an indicator like livability city index. It can assess the quality of life based on the needs of the smart cities or smart citizens, we can say. That is the first factor is safety, then security, sanitation, healthcare, education, telecom signal quality, business, spatial economic zones, electricity, environment, like air quality, noise level, greenery, water conservation, cycle track, then water availability 24 hours. There are some dry, arid areas uh, in some countries where water is not available 24 hours, but in a smart city, we must have the water. So what is the water availability? Cooking gas availability, city mobility, how the people are moving. So some factors, around 14 factors are listed, they should be taken for evaluation by the citizen participation. And I think GIS can provide a big, in, very good engine to create a model for this first, and then keep these indicators and test it after three years. When the city is functioning, after three years we can test what is the satisfaction level of the people, not overall the city, but each segment. Like say, we can have different parts of the city so we can divide and then for each, like say 100 meter by 100 meter grid, we can create the uh, satisfaction level. And uh, the same model can be applied to other cities, smart cities, and say, see how uh, other cities are performing. I think there has to be some indicators for the sustainable uh, monitoring of the smart cities. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, I think uh, we we can we can get got uh, we can get to some the key elements of the smart cities, and then uh, for me the quality of life is really uh, sounds really important. So the smart city is uh, is is not is not a purpose. It's a tool uh, how to uh, how to enrich the quality uh, quality of life quality of life. Okay. Thank you very much. So the the next speaker uh, speaker I would like to invite Dr. Long. Uh, please uh, share your uh, your views or experience on the Bean Zone Smart City uh, project. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, so um, he proposed me uh, in uh, before that I, uh, he would like me to talk something about Smart City. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
around the world. But I told him that it may be too, too large for me. So I focus in the question of how Bình Dương develop the small city. And besides of that, we can answer the question uh, how in a city in emergent, um, emergent country can develop. Um, is it possible or not? Because you know, small city usually uh, happens in USA, in Europe, in, in developed country in general or in um, um, important place of economy where you are, you, you are enough rich, then you can think about smart city. But in our point of view, it's slightly different. We use the smart city to make, make us uh, grow. Then for us, smart city is not only sustainability for the people life or for uh, environment, but also for economy. It's very important in our point of view. So when you say that smart city is a tool to leverage the life of people, I can add on and also leverage the business of, you know, the business, uh, the enterprises also. And, um, you know, in Bình um, we, we asked the first question, we, we have here Idaho Van City, Peter, <laughs> and also our partner from Idaho Van City. Uh, when we work together about smart city, our first question is, okay, we can apply IoT, technology, etc. but where can we find money to do it? It's very expensive, and you apply the technology, the IoT, it seems to be nice, but are you sure that it's bring back, you know, the, the, the profit, or, or people is uh, enough good to use well the technology, or they can also uh, involved in the production of technology or not, or just simply buying, using. You know, it's a, it's a big question we, we usually ask. So that's why we look at the different approach around the world, and we find a very nice approach from Intelligent Community Forum. It's an association of 180 different cities around the world, including New York, uh, London, you know, a big city, but also a small city in different countries. And their point of view is, it's not about smart city, it's about intelligent community. So, you know, in English, when you say smart, it's different with intelligent. You say uh, AI, but you don't say AS, right? It's not uh, artificial or smart, but you say it's and, uh, and when you say smart bomb, you never say intelligent bomb, you know. So the smart is, is a little bit different with intelligent. Intelligent is deeper in learning, in, you know, uh, more in being human. And secondly, it's community. They don't use the word city because when you talk about city, people can think about infrastructure, you can think more about material. When you say in community, people, uh, immediately refer to the connection between people, interaction, and also people themselves. So that's why uh, we follow this uh, concept. So for us, the smart city is something like, it's technology city for sure, because now we are in technology at the moment. You cannot say that you make a smart city without technology. It's also green city for sure. It's sustainable, uh, sustainability. But how to make it? So we believe it, it is like innovation city. And we try to make uh, innovative, uh, creative, uh, dynamic, and connected ecosystem. And we call it a smart city because it automatically uh, becomes smart if you are in innovation, um, um, you know, innovation uh, place, ecosystem. So we go in this way and we find that uh, so that's why we don't directly enter in the question of technology. We firstly enter in the question of institution, how to connect people better. So we go to, uh, we go to Idaho then, and also in Korea and Taiwan, many different countries and territories. Then we fight the uh, Idaho Van city and uh, we, we are become a sister city. And in this city, they apply a very nice model. Um, we, they apply something we call Triple helix is a scientific model from a Stanford University. So it's a, con it's a connection, um, it's a collaboration model between the government, the enterprise, so it's made like PPP, and also the universities. 
and all of them sit together, share the vision, uh, share also difficulties and also opportunities, etc. Knowledge about market, then they work together and build together the policies, the strategies for the region. So this is the way we start the smart city. And in one year, we already developed the culture of triple helix. Then the universities and enterprises usually work together and you know, anytime you can uh, connect easily with the government. I give you an example. Uh, we uh, try to make the semiconductor uh, in our province because we are industrial province. So we think about uh, building the, the, the factory in semiconductor. So we start a project and we make, uh, we make the feasibility study. And, and then the rector of uni the local university here, he called me, he said, yeah, I have heard about that. Uh, we will discuss that in, in the Triple Helix uh, meeting. Then he said, okay, that is a good moment. I start to make you know, a new program for education for the back end in uh, semiconductor where we want to move. So this kind of thing, you know, make people much um, make the whole system harmonized. And, and then we build together, um, and then we also define clearly our target. Um, 20 years ago, Bing Yung is a still agriculture province, and we make a revolution, industrialization. And today, we become one of the you know, relevant uh, province uh, of Vietnam for industry. But we still recognize that our industry is still traditional manufacturing. And you see that now is a moment of industry 4.0, is a moment of smart city, uh, a lot of um, movement of, uh, uh, industry, uh, of uh, factories, manufacturing move from other countries to um, Vietnam, to Malaysia, to India, to Thailand. So it's opportunities for us. So it's a moment we decide to make a second revolution so from traditional manufacturing, we move to high-tech manufacturing. So that is, that's why we have to uh, you know, plan, uh, create a new master plan and prepare for that. And this is not only about technology, but you know, if you want to move economy, it's not only economy, it's also social development to, to, to make a breakthrough. So that's why we didn't call this a breakthrough of economy or whatever, we call it smart city because you need to build you know, urban area, you need to build town to adapt the, the new requirement. You also need to build education, innovation, policies, etc. So that's why we call it smart city and we build the ecosystem, the innovation ecosystem. And we also follow, and we also move into broadband economy, I mean, or you can say digital economy, but the base of that is broadband economy. Then we follow the trend of uh, intelligent community, what I already talked to you. Uh, so we follow six criteria. The first one is broadband. Do you have a good broadband? The second one is um, the digital equality, to make sure everyone has access to you know, uh, internet. To, yeah, it's a very important tool today to create the innovation, to create new business. The third one is innovation policies. Do we have a good innovation policies here to support people, to make a business, to, to make a startup, etc.? The fourth one is um, the uh, workforce knowledge. So we have a good education here, you know, to form people, etc. The fifth one is the sustainability. So now we talk about green and this is very related. We can say, okay, I can build, I don't need to build a green city to have um, a rich city. But it's not true today. If you want to be the rich city, you need knowledge economy. If you need knowledge economy, you need to attract intellectual. Intellectual don't want to live in the machine city. They, want to, they don't want to live in the, they want to live in green uh, area. For example, so everything is related. You cannot say that uh, I just want to be rich, I don't care about the environment. It's impossible today. Yeah. You should be inclusive. And then the last one is advocacy. Everyone believe the same thing. Use the smart city like marketing, but also use the smart city like a strategy. Then everyone go in the same way, uh, you know, 
take the same values and build the same values. This is very important in our point of view. So it's the six criteria about smart, uh, I mean, intelligent community. It's a little bit close to smart city. But if you see that, so it's completely independent with IoT, with machine, you know, with the technology, with, you know, modern technology, etc. But naturally, if you adapt all the criteria, then everything will build. And today we talk about IoT, but maybe in tomorrow it's not IoT anymore. It's another technology uh, who, drive, uh, who drive the, 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 the society. But this technology always based in this kind of thing. You need always digital economy, I mean, at least in 10 years, digital economy is still innovation. The most important is always there. So this is what we build the smart city. And uh, this year, we are very happy to be announced one of uh, the 21 city in the world who, who has the most relevant uh, strategy to build a smart city. So including uh, Chicago, including Moscow in Russia, etc. So we are very happy with that and we uh, officially integrate, integrate in the uh, intelligent community this year. So we open the network with 180 um, cities around the world and continue to build our strategy and go forward for sustainability for people, for environment, society, and economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ron. So, uh, the, so Dr. Ron uh, pointed out uh, several points uh, and uh, some challenges of the small cities. The, that, uh, that elements are not only to the Binzo city itself. Maybe we can, uh, we can apply the, his points to other smart city project as well. Thank you very much for, uh, for your uh, the raising the issues. Okay, so uh, for the panelists, do you have any comments or uh, comments or the opinions or on the uh, the presentation by the uh, professor Professor Niting and Dr. Lon? Anything? Some comments on? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's uh, move to the uh, next topic. Then, uh, so the, uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, invite Mr. Anil uh, to share uh, your uh, your your experience or views on this master <coughs> from your uh, ex uh, from your perspectives. Yeah. Hi. Um, I come from a city called Bangalore in India. I've been practicing as an architect and urban planner for the last 20 years. So the, I have been able to do some research in the last 20 years and have been able to develop some theories related to city planning. So when you, uh, I, I would like to go to the fundamentals. Uh, if you look at uh, the cities world over and analyze them, uh, you could see that the population growth in each city is phenomenal. And you have a population of 13 million uh, in uh, my own hometown called Bangalore. And then Beijing has about 21 million. Shanghai has 24 million. Tokyo has about 13 million in the whole metropolis. And then uh, Ho Chi Minh City has about 12 million uh, people. So you could see this uh, population growing and then we keep complaining about traffic congestion, et cetera, et cetera. So what's fundamentally wrong about city, cities world over? So my research and analysis uh, show that uh, I, keep I keep comparing cities to human body. Uh, just like the supply lines in a human body, the city, uh, in the city, you have supply lines, water supply lines, gas supply lines, power supply lines, sewage lines, etc. Uh, taking one material from point A to another point B. And if, uh, I think fundamentally, if uh, it's the unlimited growth, that is the bane of all cities world over. Um, if it, just like in the case of a human body, if it grows infinitely, uh, that growth is considered cancerous. So in cities also, if you allow cities to grow infinitely, the city will lose its anatomy 
it's, it'll disturb and destroy its uh, complete body mechanism. So what is the solution? In simple terms, the solution is reproduction. A city must be allowed to be born, it should be allowed to grow and achieve its maturity, it should be allowed to die. And during that cycle, it should reproduce. In other words, if you are talking about Ho Chi Minh City, if you are talking about Bangalore, if you are talking about Tokyo, is, is instead of allowing it to expand infinitely, then find solutions for uh, the supply chains. Uh, in most probably you will be doing um, bypass surgeries because you'll be pu putting underpasses, you'll be putting flyovers, you'll be uh, creating flyovers between the buildings like in Hong Kong, what we have. So uh, this is not a solution. The solution is actually creating newer and newer cities. This is the fundamental flow that you see world over. And if you, there's no escape from this fact. And so that is number one. So we need to allow cities to uh, reproduce and grow into newer and younger cities. Uh, that's one of the things I would like to point out here. So when you ask, when you coin a phrase called smart, you can't expect a, a city which is extremely old to be smart and efficient because even a building, as an architect can tell you, the redundancy starts setting in after 15 years because the building's architecture would have, the technology would have changed, the architecture would have become meaningless, the culture inside that building would have changed, etc. So in a city, I believe, a city's life is about 450 to 500 years. That's what my research shows. And beyond that, the city should be allowed to die. So in, during that life period, the city should be allowed to reproduce. And so when you produce younger cities, the younger generation will be happy to move into that city because they come with that mindset. The older generation would like to stay back because their friends are there, neighbors are there, etc. So this is the fundamental issue I would like to bring forth first uh, when you talk about the city being smart. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anil. So um, I really uh, echoed your, uh, your, uh, your points. The, you, you, you shared the, your, uh, the some the fun fundamental issues of the smart city, and also the, the, your points are uh, kind of uh, the related with the next generation. Yeah. OK, so um, let's uh, uh, okay. I'll invite uh, Chaiwat. To appreciate your, your experience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, give you the information that how the uh, smart city in Thailand has developed. It. Really, we start from, firstly, we start from the uh, transit oriented development. This is the first thing that we have in 2010. Since we have some uh, city train. And then the development of the area around the city train station is not in good order. If you uh, go, have a chance to go to Bangkok, you can see that how uh, the area around the Siam station is it's developed. It is uh, privately developed. And there is no rule and regulations, no laws. And then after that, at the Asok station as well, by now, we, we cannot say that it is success because uh, the development of the area around is not in order. So after that, in uh, 2011, uh, the, the green building concept is coming. Then we have the, the law and regulation, but it is not compulsory. It is the, uh, it's depend on the private to whether they would like to develop according to the green building or not. The incentive is just the certificate. If you do good uh, uh, green building, you can get the gold certificate. Or if not so satisfied, you can get a silver one or bronze one. It's just the one that uh, give by the government. Then uh, lately, we, we expand more and more of our city train to uh, outskirts of Bangkok. Uh, for, from area to area, they issued a law, we call the land use law, 
to control the area that around the station of uh, five, 500 meters, the development should be this and that in general. Uh, that, that's quite in general. And lately, just last year, last year, the government see that if we allow the private sector to develop the area around the, the station, which of course it's supported by the transit-oriented concept, TOD concept, it's still not in good order. So our government has just assigned one of the committee called the Smart City Committee to take care of how we would develop the area. Uh, what, what is really, firstly, to give the definition of what is the smart city should be, and then what's the criteria and the guideline, and what is the incentive that uh, the government will give to the uh, private sector who will develop uh, according to this s smart city concept. Then by this committee, uh, they have issued a draft which uh, finally it will be uh, a law to enforce. It will first, uh, not, not uh, to enforce, but to give a concept. And then if uh, the developer follow this seven concept, if they fulfill all, they can, they can get the privilege on the tax, the tax deduction for eight years. If they fulfill some of this, they will, get, they will enjoy the tax incentive uh, by five years or something like this. I'd like to mention that uh, this uh, seven concept, which it is derived and then it will become uh, as the law and regulation in Thailand, is that the first thing they would like uh, to keep the good environment for the smart city, it should be resort conservation, it should have the pollution management and control, the development should be balancing between the development, the people, and the environment. And those areas should have the environmental management and monitoring program. That's the first issue about the environment, which is the compulsory. For every development, for every city, and it extends to, to the uh, smart industrial estate as well with this regulation that the first thing compulsory, if you can uh, uh, comply to the environment of these uh, four categories, okay, you can pass, you can pass and you can get the incentive uh, with uh, the other six, uh, one plus six, one, one plus another from the selected six one. Second one is the energy, of course, it has to be the efficient energy consumption. It should have the alternative green energy, uh, another two conditions under the, the category of energy. The third, third condition is living. It should be the uh, people who's living in this smart city should have the health, good healthy. <laughs> it, is, it has a detail, I just uh, brought up uh, what what's, uh, it is mentioned here is good healthy people. It should have the, provide the public safety to the people living in this uh, smart city. It should have the system, intelligent system to give the living uh, facility around the area to be in good condition. Uh, those are the living, uh, the third one. The fourth one is mobility. Because of course, when people staying together in the city or in the smart city, uh, the density of the people will be high and high, of course. So uh, the regulation that it will come out that it should be accessibility, convenience, and safety. The efficiency of the transportation, transportation should be at one level. Logistics should be good. Sharing of green mobility should be adopted. The fifth one is economy. The business, the innovation, the transformation of the, the uh, economic using in uh, the, this uh, uh, smart city should be applied. Sixth one is the people. People living there should have good knowledge, should have the uh, what knowledge about the digital. So it means that they should have a training program for people in that area as well. They should have the what, lifelong learning environment. So it means that there should be uh, uh, the training here and there for the people living. And uh, the last one, the governance. So people living together should have the governance uh, 
service accessibility to the government, to the, government. the citizen living inside should have the uh, what a good level of participation in the activities that they would like to and the governance of the people should be transparency as well so those one uh, view become a law so that to uh, strengthening the new uh, smart city in thailand including the uh, smart industrial estate as well and it start already for the area like uh, it, it has uh, uh, notified in the contract that uh, the investor who will do develop the uh, high-speed rail, the first high-speed rail in Thailand, linking uh, three airports, which they can have uh, the area at Makassan and at Siracha. They have to develop these two areas under this concept. So this is the one that it will be, I mean, under the law. So I just would like to, uh, the first round, to give the information that what is going on. Uh, thank you very much, Chai Wat. Um, the, as a uh, frequent traveler to, to Thailand, uh, I experienced the uh, highly congested <laughs> the, uh, traffic situation in the metropolitan Bangkok. So I'm really interested in how the uh, smart city project in Thailand is going to, uh, going to be in the future. Yes. <laughs> Um, Simon, do you, do you want to have something to comment? Yes, <laughs> he, he looks uh, to, to, have, to, to want to say something. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I was impressed that we are here in uh, Bin Duong. Excuse me if I don't pronounce that very well. But it gave, gave me a chance briefly on Sunday to look around and see how they have started this amazing project here. I come, I'm going to, come, I come from the healthcare angle, so if you'll forgive me, I have three quotes. They're very short, but I want to read them to you. The first one is from the W Health Organization, and it was written in 1948. It says, Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. First point. The second one, humans are social animals, and individual sense of self is greatly influenced by their social health. Social interactions are not just pleasurable, they are essential to our very person. The third one is, uh, taking me to the heart of this point. For too long, we have neglected the human dimension, being so enamored with the economic side. Buildings should improve the lives of people. This is a man called Professor Lam Ki Po of livable cities in Singapore. Our, the reason that I'm involved in smart cities and I'm just going to call them cities and leave the word smart out because Dr. Long himself has just found it difficult to find a, an interpretation of that word. So, healthcare has changed. It used to be about curing people in hospitals. It is now about what is called integrated care. How it's the total dimension from the beginning to the end of care, how people can be looked after, and more and more people now are being looked after outside of hospital in the home. This creates a connectivity between homes and health, and this is how we've been working on this. I personally have worked in five countries on cities. The first one was in Qatar, which was a, a small development, which was Kubawa City. This was a project which was uh, basically to create a new small population of about 30,000 people and they wanted to build a hospital on the side of it and we were responsible for the hospital. We moved with the Qataris to Egypt on what was called New Cairo, a development of five million people in just a little bit higher up the hill from the Nile and it was a big development that was going ahead, but unfortunately got stopped by Arab Spring in 2011. 
I worked in China in a city which I adore called Chongqing. And it's a city where they were expanding. And uh, this was a very important expansion of a district called Banan. And it was the need to, it was the, really the first time we brought healthcare, education, homes, and not just homes for the elderly, homes across the whole age range. And we brought this in with shops. We had an entire shopping street. We had all sorts of things which made it an interesting area. Now I am working on two projects. One is in the Philippines, and the, one, and the other is here in Vietnam, in Da Nang. These are projects which I am passionate about. I love these projects because I think they're very important. I also love them because we can't do them in Europe. We have old cities. Our old cities were born in the time where the horse and carriage was the main form of transport. So our cities are confined by these problems. So healthcare is not is a driver, but not the only driver. The expressions that have been created by, by Dr. Long, for example, of innovative, sustainable, green agenda, affordable, uh, affordable are, are very important aspects. The other thing is transportation. We in London, which is a city which people think is a, a good city, but nevertheless, 9,600 people die from pollution every year, and 50% of those are children. It is a disaster, and it is created by the car, and it's created by vehicles. And when I go, excuse me if I quote one or two examples, when I go into Sukhumvit in Bangkok, I see the lid over the road, <laughs> which is created by the trans transit system. And they, make their, they do their cooking underneath, and the temperature underneath there is at least three degrees more than when, when you go off to the left or right, right? And when, excuse me again, if I go to Shanghai, they have double layers of roads. And the top layer is, creates the lid over the bottom. And that must create a pollution problem. Must create a pollution problem. So, when we look at cities, we have to look at the holistic component of cities, not just any one component. And this is what absolutely fascinates me. We can look at it from different perspectives. The other thing, if I may say, is infrastructure is incredibly important, but it is also an abuse sometimes. New York, 25% of Manhattan is made up of infrastructure roads. 5% of Manhattan is made up of Central Park. They are now revisiting that to see if they can find a way to try and rebalance that a little bit more. When we talk about health and care and the way we live and the fact that we need to have communities, not houses, we need to have communities where people live, enjoy their and have prosperity Prosperity not in money, but prosperity in their life. When we look at these things, we also have to look at things like parks. When we think of any project that we think of, we look at, excuse me if I use percentages very quickly, we, use, we look at around about 17.5% for infrastructure, and we use at least another 17.5% for parks. Because this is one of the we call these the lungs of our city in London. They create trees, eat carbon dioxide, and deliver off oxygen. So they are life-saving and life-giving. So these are the aspects that we are particularly interested in, and we want to be able to look at that with all of you, because you've got expertise which I haven't got, but perhaps I have just a little bit of expertise which other people might like to abuse or use. So this is really what I wanted to tell you and explain from my perspective why healthcare and smart cities go together. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, so your, your, your viewpoints are really kind of uh, human-centric. 
the, the elements, then uh, I actually the, I, um, I didn't have uh, not, not so much idea how, how do you uh, discuss uh, discuss on the small city from the, your the kind of healthcare point of view. So I was really impressed by the, the your uh, your discussion. Thank you very much. And then um, maybe uh, okay. So we, we still have three speakers to yeah. But uh, uh, maybe so. Anil, do, do you have any comments on the Simon's the point of view? So I, I think yeah. the, uh, in the, your your points are, are more like. A, uh, the really related with the next generation, how to create a sustainable uh, city or sustainable community. Maybe it's uh, uh, the deeply related with uh, Simon's point of view. Well, yeah, uh, I uh, agree uh, quite a bit with uh, Mr. Simon's point of view. Um, I think the points that he just outlined are extremely essential when you uh, plan a city. Um, those are the elements that will make the city more livable and healthy. However, however, my fundamental point was that a city should be uh, on a, it, it, should be, it should be a constant process. Evolution of a city should be a constant process. It's not frozen in time. Um, a city is born, it acquires the maximum size and growth potential. It should be allowed to die and then it should, in the meantime, it should reproduce. So this is the axiomatic truth, universal truth. Nothing is constant, nothing is permanent, everything goes through the life and death cycle and the regeneration. And it is absolutely true in the case of cities, number one. Number two, while you're planning that, the city that I'm talking about, uh, and while it grows, it should also grow multicentric. Very important to understand, because if you look at human body, if you look at any living organize, organism, any, if you look at the planetary systems in the universe per se, what you see is everything is multicentric. We have a solar system with the center, sun as a center. We have a body with a lot of cells and some centers. And so if you allow the city to grow with just one center infinitely, then it cannot sustain. So the city has to have multi-centers, and the growth should be multicentric. That's one of the important points. Then somehow, the, the second point I would like to make now is that somehow there is this notion that a city, uh, a smart city is something uh, made out of glass towers spread over a nice landscape. That is absolutely not correct. Uh, in fact, if you look at glass as the material, let's look at glass as just one material that is used in construction. The, if you see the quality of uh, the property of glass, um, you know the, the radiation from the sun comes in the form of short waves. Glass has two properties: it'll con convert the short wave into long wave, and it'll allow only the transmission of short wave. Which means the radiation can come into a building, and it cannot go back. This will result in heat entrapment and it'll heat up the building which is called the greenhouse effect. So too much of use in glass, of glass in tropical countries like Vietnam, in India, in Singapore, etc., is absolutely counterproductive. Because it'll heat up the building, you have to put more powerful air conditioning building like this building. We are using extremely powerful air conditioning and actually you are freezing people to death. So my point is this, if you can open up the buildings, you know, in tropical countries, the, you can allow the air to come in, light to come in, etc. It will consume less amount of energy. This is called living with nature. And so consumption of less material, living with nature, will actually result in uh, production of uh, smart cities. So these are some of the elements that will come together to make the, build, uh, the city smart. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your valuable, uh, valuable comments. Then, um, uh, let's move to the, uh, Mr. A, uh, Mr. Iska's presentation. Uh, the, he is a specialist on the education. The education is uh, education is a kind of the core, the, the how can I say the, uh, the core uh, of the um, how can I say the, the our, our the mindset. So the education is also the. Uh, highly connected with the uh, discussion uh, from Simon and Adil. Uh, please, uh, Izuka-san. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. 
So, uh, my background is uh, IT and uh, IT based serial entrepreneur. So, uh, lack of uh, staff. So, I'm president of university and the president of Nature City. So, our project is called Bikini Rom Nature City. So, 100 kilometers from Cambodia, capital city. So, and owned by one company on uh, top of the mountain and with, with rich nature. And the foundation layer is uh, eco tourism. So we, we prohibit to say smart city because if we make city 100% have to be smart city, so no need to say. So, and so we have 9,000 hectare land, but we cut only 4% tree. And after cut 4% tree, we plant 4% tree. So number of the tree is the uh, same before development and later. This is our policy. And our target population is uh, only 100,000 people. This is very, very small compared to Tokyo or a normal city. So in our case, city is uh, just a brand name. Maybe not, not uh, maybe city. So, but how uh, 100,000 people live together is uh, uh, we do big experiment. So maybe kind of small city exper experiment in the forest. So we do strategic thinking. So how to win competition between smart city? So our strongest is a low cost operation and big nature and education and IT and tourism. So we cut uh, some er element. We are based on the blue ocean strategy. We are not normal city. So we are special function city. So we focus ecotourism and education, IT, and retirement, maybe health, health uh, industry. So, and we don't consider permanent living. Maybe minimum one day, maximum five years. So this is kind of co-living. So, and our model, model come from Google campus and Infosys Bangalore campus. This, so if the, these two city in the forest and open to the tourists, uh, I'm really happy, so I try to do this. So, and uh, our city is uh, following the SDGs. That means no social problem city. Well, especially in Japan, so the busing rate is down. Maybe problem come from education. So we want to say uh, solve this problem. So uh, maybe like this, and we want to. Uh, uh, save road size, Ro road construction very bad. How road size be half? So we decide to block all private car. So driverless electric car plus uh, share light model. So anyway, we are doing experiment. So and we don't. We also don't like bicycle. Bicycle is uh, pollution. Uh, my idea. So we we want to choose uh, electric kickboard. So but not so safe but it's uh, maybe a better solution. So, and the basic concept is walking. Walking city is make health better. So, maybe, uh, I think sometimes uh, we are not city. We are very huge social hotel, maybe 100,000 people. Maybe uh, this is uh, uh, may, uh, maybe like this. So anyway, so we minimize concrete. I don't, I hate concrete. Minimize concrete and uh, uh, 30 square meter per residence because <laughs> maybe capsule hotel in the big forest. So because the uh, forest is good, so we living in the nature. So we try to do this. So uh, yeah, and all factory profit and uh, even agriculture maybe not good. So maybe 95 percent agriculture prohibit. So. And best water, we have to try best water recycle system, maybe like California, maybe toilet water can drink. So maybe don't flow to the river. So maybe our city is uh, like this. Ah, and uh, why we have university inside is uh, this is a project-based learning for our students. So our KIT students do everything infrastructure for our smart city. So that's it. So maybe I want to feed back my uh, big experiment as a smart city. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Izuka. Uh, his concept is really uh, sounds like uh, very, very new for me. 
and maybe uh, uh, all of you too. The, so it's it's a literary, the sustainable. So the Mr. Is, uh, is, uh it seems to uh, realize the literary, the the sustainable city. Or I, I think this, this the word city itself is not adequate for his concept. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so the, let's uh, let's move to the uh, the. the the two uh, other, uh, the last two speakers, uh, the team and uh, team and Lou, um, uh, please uh, share your uh, your ideas and concepts. So, the, the you are you are the specialist on the designing and the housing something. Yeah, uh, you first one. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, team, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, I come from a strategic design background, so many of these problems are very familiar when you, when you start to look at anything that requires uh, creation and development. Um, the question of how smart cities can drive sustainable growth, I think, is the fundamental part. And to me, the idea of looking at the process is one of the most important pieces. And that means making sure that the solutions, the things that are being described here, uh, continue to be focused on human outcome. And if you focus on human outcome, uh, ultimately, the results have the, the beneficial economic and, and uh, other development out outcomes that most nations are looking for. Um, we understand there's a projected $7 trillion of investment in the next 12 years coming in, into this region. So I think with that, there's opportunities for us to start to think about looking at the picture a little bit differently. And what that means is we have an extraordinary opportunity to leapfrog some of the old challenges, some of the old systems. And whether, whether it's to live, live and die and see a reproductive city or to look at other types of approaches, it would be absurd for us to approach creating new solutions the same way and expect different outcomes. So I think the onus is on us to look at creating new solutions and exploring new ways given the, such, such an impact that we'll, we will be having globally. So I, I have basically two insights, um, and this comes much from our work that we're doing in, in China, but you know, in Asia broadly. The first is the shift towards a quality of life. And we see this more and more from what we learned from rapid expansion in China was some tissue rejection when it came to just creating housing versus, versus creating homes. And I think this idea that, again, moving back to focusing on human outcomes becomes essential. And we try to define that as understanding the experience that people have, designing a human experience as, as a core piece of that. And to some degree, it means moving away from solving problems. And this may sound a little strange, but it's moving from problem solving to value creation. And the value creation is human value. The human value then leads to the economic value. And so the more we solve for problems, the more we understand that we've already created a condition that we have to fix. And that means we have so much friction as a result of creating something to fix that it becomes almost impossible. So it's important not to go into the repetition of old mistakes and then try to solve the problems that those old mistakes created. Um, if you focus on the positive human outcomes, as I mentioned, um, we see uh, uh, positive economic ones, but also the opportunity for extraordinarily successful communities. And Singapore is often held up as an example of a nation that's been able to balance livability with economic success. And Lee Kuan Yew is commonly held up as a political leader with great sensitivity and insight. Um, I wrote a, a piece a few years ago about him as, as an extraordinary designer. And most of the time you don't, you don't think of a politician as a designer. But this is also someone who, while in the, in the process of creating an economic environment and, and uh, places for homes, planted 10,000 trees per year. The idea that, that he would have the insight or the foresight to plant 10,000 trees per year and have to go back and rationalize the economic value of doing that um, meant that there was a much deeper uh, understanding of the human value that he was creating. The second point is, and I, I think it relates to technology, we, we often 
confuse a technological capability with a technological value. And what that means is, while we're busy in creating the thing that, that we can do, we often lose sight of whether or not it matters to anyone. Um, if you look at most startups, 95% of startups fail historically. 42% of the reason, and it's the number one reason that startups fail, is there a technology looking for a solution, which means they weren't really solving a human outcome. They were trying to apply a technological innovation. So I think it's, imp it's important if you look in, in the health space, and, and I think Simon mentioned the, the health space, 30% um, of Chinese today are overweight. That's 300 million people. 73% are now exercising. And there's an application called, called Keep, which some of you may or may not be aware of, but the trend is to teach people how to exercise and how to take care of their health better through this application. They now have 140 million users, and in the last six months, they've added 40 million users. So this is something that's you know, very, very current and very relevant. Also, if you look at uh, an application called WIM, which is being used in Helsinki, um, what's happening there is um, people are, are being able to manage the way you move throughout a city. And again, the discussion around mobility as a, as a key uh, element in a, in a, in a city. Um, designing for, for value means you have to look not only at the individuals and the corporations, but you have to look at the societal and environmental factors. Um, and just lastly, I think I, I mentioned earlier in a conversation to beware of best practices, <laughs> and most people don't tell you that, but um, I heard a gentleman in one of the other uh, sessions talk about which of the five economic models were we going to follow. And the one he left out was the sixth one, which was to create a new one. And I think we should not <laughs> forget that there's an opportunity for creation. We don't have to always emulate something else. But don't forget there's an opportunity to create something new. That's what I would say. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. So then, uh, I'm also living in Singapore now. So I, uh, yes, I, I feel that some, uh, the, how can you say that? Uh, I also uh, agreed with uh, your some points that on the on the policy by the Singapore Singapore government. Mm -hmm. and also, the, the the example of the China, the, the China itself uh, has has a really huge population, and then the the figures uh, surprise us always. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. <laughs> then okay, uh, the, let me uh, invite the last but uh, la last speaker. Yeah. Dalu, uh, please uh, share your uh, experience and opinions. Sure. Uh, thank you, Takashi-san, and thank you, panelists and the audience, uh, for everything today. So. Thank you very much for waiting <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> this is a fascinating topic for me. So my name is Lou, and I'm the CEO of Lou Moon Creates. I look at this a little bit from a different angle. Um, so we don't build smart cities. We have worked with tens of thousands of buildings and mainly residential buildings. So we really see this development from inside the household, right? So what we do, we actually work on, we engineer and manufacture glass facades for indoor outdoor spaces, what we call transitional spaces. So this is something that we do. Then recently co-founded another company called Future Urban Living, realizing how fast everything is changing. And we're trying to solve the DNA level problems of a lot of organizations. Um, trying to get involved in a sustainable city or sustainable urban environments. So a lot of these things that have been mentioned in here, I, I do agree. I am also moving from the smart or inte intellectual city into what um, Mr. Lovegrove here mentioned already to livable environments. And this is the way uh, I like to look at things as well. So we're based in China, right? and we've mentioned China many times as well, to really understand the development and the changes China is going through is to look at its social fabrics. And to look at its social fabrics, it's really about the people. So if we just look at the three generations and the way people have changed from my gra grandparents to my parents to my generation is from seven children, communities living in collective living all together, multiple families, never lock indoors, into my, my parents' generation, 
uh, which is already very different, cultural revolution, opening up to the world, to my generation of one-child policy, individualistic living, sky-high rises where we don't know neighbors, and this has all just happened in a couple of decades. So really to understand this and to ask the question of why are we developing into the area of you know, smart cities or intellectual cities or livable cities, what, what is the purpose behind all of this, right? And really to look at Shanghai, I like to take the people perspective on this. So Shanghai, as you mentioned, we have 24 million people, makes it the biggest city proper in the world. Out of 24 million, our fertility rate today is less than 1%, it's very low. Uh, there are different contexts to this, of course. Life expectancy is the highest in China. So what this means is that you have lots of old people, like, uh, more old, old people, uh, very small percentage of new kids being born, and urban migrants of 40%, which is a very high number. At the same time, the city depends on um, these young people in source of labor and innovation. But at the same time, because of our very unique um, hukou policy, social security policy in China, urban migrants very often are not fully integrated in the city that they live in. Um, this means that their kids' education system and elderly care are not integrated in Shanghai, for instance, where they have lived in 10 or 20 years maybe working. So to really look at these type of problems for, for, for us is to understand um, how can you maximize the human potential of these communities? How can you build a system and design a system in a city that supports this type of human capital, right? Because when we talk about smart cities today, uh, for me, a lot of it is optimizing systems through digital layers to optimize our resources. So that's energy usage, that might be transport, that might be you know, food production. But really, what's behind all of this uh, goes very much back to what Mr. Kobe was saying as well. What is the meaning behind all of that? What is the, how do we maximize the human capacity behind all of this? And what makes the city livable? So really, when we look at housing, and the industry that I am in, we very much work with different types of spaces. And today our spaces are built, they're not really built for 21st century, of course. Uh, they're very dumb. Um, even if you look at this space, for instance, this space is already, you know, all these walls over here and walls over there, they're retractable, so you can move them away and, and modify this into something bigger. And we need these type of solutions much more, but on a city level and on a neighborhood level, so that they're more agile for human needs. And this is my perspective on this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Lou. Um, the, yep. Yes, the, the Shanghai is uh, one of the largest cities in, in the world. And then, city proper, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then, uh, the, I'm I'm struck by the some uh, high uh, expect high expectancy rate. The the Japan also have a the, the similar program, and then uh, we are uh, we are going to be a super aged society. Then uh, then we we have a uh, lots of uh, lots of problem how to how to resolve it, and then uh, how how to the people can lead the the. I mean, the, in, in terms of the uh, not not, phys not not physical development, not more more like a mental uh, mentally rich mm -hmm. <laughs> life, uh, how to read that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much for your mm -hmm. the views. Then, uh, Tim, do you, do you, do you have anything to say? So <laughs> you look stupid. <laughs> uh, yes, please. please yeah. So uh, lastly, I would like to say that. Uh, many smart cities are coming up and uh, there are two things we have to take care. One is the uh, evaluation for their sustainability. So we should have some kind of a uh, measurable indicator. So I propose a livable city index and we can prepare like a map every three years and uh, see the report. Second is carrying capacity of all the smart cities. Like in this room, how many people can sit? 
same way in a smart city how many people can live that has to be determined and uh, there should be strict enforcement that no more than that if there is another population and then you have to create another smart city like uh, anil has told that one city can give birth to another one but it should not die on its own weight i think we have to be very careful for the future thank you sir thank you very much so so uh all the panelists uh do do you have any comments to uh, or, or sh share the, the views okay yeah any please yeah come on sorry just one last comment um i think um the interpretation of being smart should be ap appropriate and optimum as you just mentioned um anything excessive cannot be smart you mentioned about technology um whether technology is just there for the sake of using it you just put into some building and then ca call it smart whether it's smart or not is the question and so i think you are right uh, we need to be very careful when you select technology um you mentioned about uh, livability which is absolutely correct i um, i feel um, when you talk about human centric city uh, my city models that i've designed over the last few years are uh, they, they are based on um, the uh, by, by based on the fact that they, they give a lot of importance to pedestrians and cyclists so i i feel uh, the city should be primarily designed for pedestrians and cyclists and uh, in my city model i um, have come out with uh, uh, an idea where the city can be designed in a radial fashion so it's like a christmas cake why is Chris, have you wondered uh, why christmas cakes are designed the way they are designed because when you cut it triangle triangle of it when you cut it radially then you'll get the ingredients all ingredients in one piece so any section will have all ingredients so that is the advantage of designing a city in a radial fashion uh, one last point is this i think uh, anything that is i mean when you design a city you should you should think about the planet uh, when you say if you actually make a planet friendly city it is also smart because uh, you know when you when you go into excessive use of material um, it will be absolutely planet unfriendly and we are already um, the planet is i believe is taking the stress of the human greed to quite an extent and if we continue to um exert this stress on the planet uh, we are going to use, lose the biodiversity di diversity in the next 50 years that's the estimate so i think we need to make it make the cities planet friendly when i say planet friendly you're talking about climate you're talking about material you're talking about um uh, everything the natural resources etc um, that, that that's about it thank you thank you very much okay we are, we still have the 10 minutes uh Okay, so I, I would like to open the discussion to the floor. Uh, so, oh, please. Um, yeah, yes, please. please uh, um, thank you for your uh, very interesting different perspectives on uh, the uh, smart city or smart community or just, uh, well, I say uh, every city. Um, one thing which uh, came to my mind that uh, we talk a lot about smart technology, but Actually, I missed the whole word data because it's not the technology which makes the city smart. It's the data we collect in all these techy IoT type of devices and which we eventually use to collect and to interpret and to use the algorithms to make the smart decisions, which eventually should influence, hopefully, impact in a good way the life of people. So maybe m one of you can reflect on that. The second is, um, Mr. Izuka, please come to Holland because We're not banning the cyclist, even we're building cy fast cycle paths for the inter-regional commuters, where we're also introducing electric pathways to get rid of uh, mobile or fossil transportation and remove it and even substitute it with, with bicycles. So maybe we have a different vision on that. Um, I'd really like to understand a little better the, the whole concept of smart cities in India. You mentioned big figures, um, but I am, um, imagine that this is not only a public investment so 
can you elaborate a little on how you share this investment, public, private, and how do you manage to do that in a proper way so that you don't deliver the, the city to Alibaba or Amazon or any other tech giant? And my third remark is I really like the definition of healthcare, as uh, you mentioned, um, because health is a state of mind, but it's also the ability to participate in society and economy, even if you're living with a certain condition. But what um, uh, came to my mind is that um, in Asia, there is a hospital-centric type of healthcare. So in Vietnam, you don't go to a GP or a, a general practitioner doctor, but you straight go to the hospital. So even if we want to stretch the whole healthcare paradigm into uh, self-responsible people, also extend it to our neighborhoods, we also have to come over a kind of culture barrier where a regular citizen in Asia prefers to go to a hospital instead of go to a local doctor. So thank you for uh, some of your comments on these. Any comments or response to uh, his points? Yeah. Oh, please, yeah, Sam. Uh, you're absolutely right. GPs or primary care is only actually practiced in about five countries in the world. So I'm not advocating it. What we are saying is that hospitals fit within the continuum, not in isolation. We also suggest that the problem here, as in every other country in the world, is the increase in diabetes, the increase in obesity, the increase in heart disease, the gravitation towards uh, cities, uh, in China alone, I think it's about 100 million people a year are moving towards cities, and overall, by 2050, 2.5 billion more people will be in cities. So these are the issues. The solutions is one, clinical progress. We are getting much, much reduced length of stay, so people don't have to stay in hospital so long. But the correlation of that is they need to be given some attention outside. It can be done with informatics, it can be done with various things, and the connectivity of informatics between the home and the hospital is one of the solutions that is very important. Uh, I think I've covered most of the points that you raised on the healthcare side, but um, those are the things which I find particularly interesting and why I think it's something that we can really do very, very well. And it's something that's only available today and it wasn't available yesterday. One last point that you made, Ying, was flexibility. This is very important. And I'm from a country where I grew up in a house which was 500 years old when I started and it's uh, 590 years old now. And I then bought, as a family, we bought a house which was 600 years old because we liked the idea of living in an old house. And then when I bought a house in London at one stage, I was told it would be knocked down within 40 years, even though it was new at the time. So flexibility is, flexibility is very important in, in the way that you do design. And it's also very important in the design of healthcare. And that's important in the design of transportation because transportation is changing. BMW now are suggesting that their business is mobile transportation, not cars. Chairman, uh, please. Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Chairman. I just would like to wrap up that uh, I support him quite a lot. Many, many points, it's in the same direction. The thing is that I would like us to realize that moving people into the city, it is the, 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 the uh, normal phenomena. We cannot escape, we cannot avoid this thing because really in city, uh, it's like the economic induced. Because you stay in the city, you know that the uh, cost of water in the city is much cheaper because the density is quite a lot. Electricity for the, for the city is much cheaper than electricity for the rural area. And job. You have a lot of job in the city. So of course it is the, the normal phenomena that people will be moving into the city. We cannot avoid. Like in Thailand by now, we have the statistic that uh, 20% of our population is in city. Since uh, we are still uh, developing countries, but for the developed country, 
the statistics say that the population is about 50% in the city, and they have a large city elsewhere around the country as well. So we have to face with it. So what we should do, uh, as, as I say, a sample in Thailand, we will issue a law and regulations to control and try to induce the people, try to uh, make the people to aware that smart city is quite important to get ready for people to moving in the city. The problem that we will face, uh, I will point out three things. One is that the population density of the city will be high. Of course, the health problem will be more and more. Social problem as well. In the city, we have more social problem. And in their hometown as well, because separation of the family will, 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 uh, will happen for the people who is uh, looking for a job in the labor level or in the service level. They cannot take their family to stay in the city because the uh, cost of living is high. So separation of the family is one of the social problems that we have to we will face. Second thing is the congestion will cause the pollution. We have a lot of pollution in the city. We have solid waste, we have waste water. So we have to looking for the more efficient technology, better management of this thing. Third point I would like to mention is that uh, consumption in the city will be high. Since the density is high, so we have to looking for water like Bangkok. For every year, we have we have additional water that we have to feed in Bangkok. Energy as well, we have to produce energy from somewhere else to feed Bangkok to make it. Uh, it it's not much uh, bigger in size, but density is very much higher when we finish the city train. So uh, that will will we have to find more technology to deal with these three issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan. Okay, the last question, please. <laughs> well, uh, Chairman, I'm Wei from uh, Malaysia. I'm an investor in technology business, and also I'm uh, a regulator in the telecommunication, telecommunication and multimedia industry. I have a comment, and that can also be a question. Smart city, it, it is a great concept, especially when we can plan into new areas, green field. Quite often, we have brown field, we have also the existing areas of which we don't have the luxury of planning this. And not every city has the same problem. Uh, that means not every city has got the water problem, not every city has the same traffic problem, or cleanliness problem, or waste management, or healthcare. Every city has its own characteristic, and there's a reason why different people choose to stay in that city. The young people like to stay in certain area. Chances that there isn't much of the health problem. So the so-called smart health is less relevant there versus city whereby there are a lot more old folks, a lot of old folks that you know you need to have more home care. So I think the command is this. There is need to be able to customize the smartness because we can always put all kind of sensors, all kind of technology. However, the engagement with the citizen, it is actually one of the most important conduit to receive those information about what makes life worth living and smarter over there because the need of the population will be quite dynamic. And then let's say some city you know, as simple as lighting, brightness in some areas, how would the planner know whether that place is bright enough or not, right? But the citizen who live there could actually provide the feedback either through some kind of app mechanism or whatever it is. So in other words, the engagement with the citizen will be one of the most important elements in continuous uh, uh, what called building of the smart city because it's going to be dynamic and it's a journey. It's not going to be the end point. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, the, our time is uh, running out already. So the, the plenary session at the auditorium, the auditorium is going to start. So uh, I have to end this session. Then uh, anyway, the, uh, we, uh, we must be more human centric uh, when we talk about the smart city. So if we talk about uh, the city development, 
we are tend to on the physical development, but uh, we uh, we learned a lot from the older panelists, uh, the views. Uh, we must be more human centric. Uh, thank you very much for your presence for this session. Thank you very much. Uh, group, group photo. <laughs>